Hello, everyone. This is Axel and Ali from the Product Intelligence team, and this is the Snowtool 2.0 workshop Q&A. We'll be talking about how to collect event data, and we'll be showing some examples. Let's go through the subjects we're going to be talking today. We are going to start talking about Snowplow. Uh, what is Snowplow? Where to capture data? What is included in a Snowplow event? Then we'll talk about how to build an event, and we'll be showing a, a lot of examples. Uh, some code samples, and then we'll talk about the event dictionary and next steps out as outlined in our roadmap. And then we have a Q&A session at the end. So let's start with our approach to analytics. So what we want is a standardized implementation and data to provide a common format for all GitLab team members to capture, process, and analyze data. And this is a good moment to talk about the differences between the usage pin and Snowplow. The usage pin being our most used tracking tool uh, used to dispatch transactional data settings and Redis counters uh, as an example, uh, and an interval. Against a Snowplow that gives us the full payload of each event, and it also runs uh, fairly uh, uh, at real time, uh, in quotes. So we get that event data in our data warehouse quickly. Let's dive in uh, into Snowplow. The Snowplow is an open source event-based tracking tool that allows us to extract, transform, and load data. So we can track the way the users engage with our website. The, another important thing is that allows us to rely in our own infrastructure. So the analysis happens in our own data warehouse. You can see in this diagram uh, about the data flow that the Snowplow uh, shows in its documentation. And we'll be focusing on the event sources or how to capture data. And we'll be talking about validation using schemas. So uh, Ali, you can go ahead. We collect Snowplow events from two different sources. There's the web browser, where we automatically have page views and page pings. And in terms of structured events that you can add, some examples would be clicks, rendering components, and any other custom events. And on the back end, we have structured events. For example, you could add stuff related to database operations, API actions, or any other custom events that are needed. What's included in a snowplow event? When you're defining an event, you have five different structured event fields to work with. And these are used to describe what's going on, try to describe various, various parts of it. And then we have the default snowplow context, which includes a bunch of data that's captured automatically. Most of this is only available on the front end. For example, you'll get OS, screen size, time zone, URL, browser information. And the product intelligence team has added some GitLab specific fields that are collected. For example, environment, whether it's production or staging, source, if it's front end or back end as well as some metadata like project ID and namespace ID. Back to you, Axel. Thank you. So let's talk about, now that we know more about Snowball, let's talk about how to build an event. So as Ali said, uh, the main source of data is the structure events, and we have the following fields available. First, we have action that is, you could say that is the most important field as it's described the action the user is taking or the aspect that's being instrumented. And if we take a look at our code in front end, we are going to see a lot of click button uh, actions. And we could also see uh, actions like activate for input. And uh, we have a, a, a naming convention for the action that's basically uh, write the name of the action as the first word, and then try to identify um, the the element with uh, separated with underscore. And you can you can also take a look at this uh, on the documentation. Then we have the category, and this is automatically provided 
on front end and in back end, it, it is usually the name of the class. Then we have some optional fields like label, that's an identificator of uh, the element. We have property, that's any additional property that we want to add uh, to the event. And we have value, but property and value don't, they don't have any relationship, any direct relationship. A property is any additional property we want to add to the event and value is any arbitrary number that we consider it is related to the event. Then we have a field that it is not part of the, of the structure event schema, but something that we added afterwards. And this is an extra object that uh, allowed us to uh, store any kind of key value pairs so we can extend uh, any event with several, uh, several pieces of data. So let's jump into the fun part. We are going to see a bunch of examples. Uh, in this first example, we are talking about uh, this uh, use case. We need to know how many items are being clicked and in which pages are used and which are the most clicked items. So let's start with the action. In this case, uh, it is pretty, pretty simple. We are going to attach this to each of the buttons. So it will be click navigation link. Then the category is provided automatically. So uh, in this case, it will be root index. So we are, we are in the home page. Then we have the label that again is the identificator of the element that's being added on. And in this case is the main navigation. And then as property, we are storing the label of each link. And we are not passing anything uh, to value or extra. Let's jump into the second example. And in this case, we are going to be talking about uh, variable data. So we recently implemented a new feature and that's Swimplane. And that's behind a toggle. So we need to know if users are interacting with it and how. In this case, the action is click toggle button. And the category, again, is automatic, but in this case, is the, is the name of the road of the page. The label will be toggle swim lanes as the identificator of the toggle. And then we have, in this case, as it is a Boolean value, we have, we could either put it on the property field, and you can see a ternary where uh, we set on and off based on the state of the toggle, or we could go and use value to store the binary representation of the, of the Boolean value. And we can see that we don't pass anything as extra either. This is another interesting example because it shows us how to relate, how to make a relationship between events uh, using the session ID, of course, and in this case, the use case is some of our users were deleting registry entries by mistake, like they were clicking around and they, they click a, the delete button by mistake and somehow that we got a ticket for that. So uh, we added a confirmation dialogue and we need to know the impact of the solution if it worked. So in this case, we added two events, uh, one for the actual button and that will, prompt, uh, that will show the prompt. And in this case, the action is click button. Uh, I'm talking about the event uh, at the left. The category uh, automatically provided as well. The label will be the name of the button, in this case, registry delete, and we don't pass anything uh, on the rest of the fields. And then we have another event for the actual confirmation of the deletion. And in this case, we could see that if we analyze the data afterwards. We, could, we will be able to see if a user are completing the action of the relation, and that will mean that, that, uh, that our solution was, was okay. Uh, although if we saw that only the first event is being fired, that will mean that uh, we did good because that, that they are not, they are not um, continuing with the deletions. So in that case, uh, or feature was uh, had a pretty good impact. This is another interesting example because we are going to see several ways of defining this same event. So uh, in this case, we added two new buttons to the chart option toolbars and let me minimize the... This 
There, we added two new buttons to the chart option toolbar, and we need to know if users are using them frequently. As you can see, the payload of this event is pretty straightforward based on the previous event. We are, have a, an action, in this case, as we have a, several buttons. We have an action for each of them. In this case, we have a generate, generate link action, and we have a click at level button action for, again, for two different events. The category is automatically provided. The label in this case will be chart option because we're talking about the toolbar and we are passing a, a, the chart link and the label ID as properties. With this same use case, we could switch around the taxonomy we're using. So we could, instead of having a specific action for each of the button, we could go with the generic click button action and this will be just fine because it, it, it is that what it's doing. And we are using the label that is, uh, that again, is the identificator of the element to, uh, to make sure to put the name of the actual element, in this case, char generate link for the link generation and the add label for the, for the label. And you can see that we are not passing uh, in this, in this um, second example, we are not passing any properties we were passing the uh, generated link and the label ID. And if we take a look at the use case, what we want to know is the frequent, the, the, the frequency of the, of the usage of these buttons. We don't actually need to know about which buttons or which link was, was generated. So less data might be, might be a good uh, choice. And this is, a pretty creative way to uh, create a label. As you can see, this is the only difference uh, against the, the previous example. And you can see that it used a pretty creative uh, naming convention. And this, uh, this is, again, this, is, this might be allowed as well. Of course, it will be a nice idea to document it uh, about the, <laughs> the naming convention. But uh, what we want to say is that we have uh, a lot of flexibility to define the, the data that we want to store. And the last example of the front end will be this use case. We added a lightweight filter search bar to the requirements page, and we need to know if the users are interacting with it and how. So in this case, we have uh, the action will be filter. The category, it is automatically provided. And we have uh, the same uh, the same for the for the label, and this might happen. The action that you are performing is a, is filtering, is a filter, and the element is a filter as well. So uh, fair enough. And we are using the extra property, the extra object. So we pass along uh, the term that was being used for the filtering. We pass an array of authors with the operator usage and the author ID and a boolean value. So now let's jump to Ali with some backend examples. So in this case, we need to track pushes and deletions to the container registry for both tags and repositories. So you can see the action is notification received, category is container registry event. The label is the action itself, which is either a push or a delete. The property is track target, which could be a tag or a repository. And in this case, we need to track new releases created using the API. We need to know the status code and if release CLI was used. So the action is create release. The category is API releases. In the label, we put whether or not the release CLI was used. And in the value, we put the status code. Keep in mind, value is a number. So status here would be like 200, for example. Back to you, Axel. So let's show some code samples. And in this first quarter, we made sure we have the same capabilities for dispatching events from both backend and frontend. And you can see that we have uh, a few APIs in the web browser on, or JavaScript. We have the ability to uh, declare events using the uh, data attributes. Uh, that, and that will be common on HTML or Helm, for example. Uh, 
on, and on view templates, of course. Uh, if we want to track custom events, we have the access to the track a tracking mixing for view. And if we are using JavaScript, uh, raw JavaScript, we are able to use the event method of the tracking class directly. And for the race application, we have the tracking event uh, method as well. So let's see this code sample. In this case, uh, it is the first uh, way that we have to declare events. And this in, it will be with HTML and data attributes. And this is, again, the simplest way to track event. And it is automatically dispatched on click. So in the example A, we have data attributes on a home template, and it is using the tracking attributes helpers. And this merges with other data attributes that we might have uh, declared on that element. So that's neat. Then we have the example B, and that will be uh, this same data attributes used on a view component, in this case, a GitLab UI button. And then we have the example C, where we use variable content on the data track value property. And you can see that this uh, data attributes match with the taxonomy we showed before. If we talk about view and custom events, we can use the provided view mixing. And this exposes a track method. And you can see that in the, in the code sample A, we are importing the class and we are uh, using the mixing method. In B, we are calling uh, uh, a custom view method on the off event. And then on C, we are implementing the tracking function and this, in this case, we are using this track. And you can see that the first parameter is toggle off, that's the action. And then we pass along uh, other data, uh, like in this case, the label. An interesting thing when using view is that we can set default properties that are going to be available for all the track calls. When the mixing is invoked, we can add it as you can see it in the example that we can pass along uh, the label. And in this case, it will be A. We could also use a, a tracking data object. And you can see that it has a custom category and a label of anchor. Or we could even use a computer property if we want, if we have a variable data that we want to store. And in this case, you can see that uh, the category is coming from a prop, uh, from a prop. And the label is uh, it is variable with, uh, based on the element. All the duplicated properties that we might uh, uh, create get merged with the regular uh, merging strategy of object on JavaScript. And the last example of the front end is using RoyS. And in this case, you can see that uh, we are using tracking event directly and it supports all of the uh, options available on the previous method. You can see that in this case, we are getting a button and we are adding an event listener to click events. We are declaring the event data and you can see that we are getting uh, the, the, the label, the property and the context from, uh, um, from, the, from other sources, in this case, a constants file. And then we are firing the tracking event directly and this all works the same because uh, all of the tracking methods used on front end are uh, standardized on a single class. Now let's jump to Ali with some backend examples. So on the backend, we have one way to track snowplow events, <clears throat> and that's using the GitLab tracking module. You call event on that, and as you can see on the right, we. This is a sample event where category is epics, action is promote, property is issue ID. We have a value, project user namespace, that's GitLab specific metadata. And we have weight, which is an extra property. And below that, you can see how we would test this. We have a Snowplow test helper available. You can annotate your tests with Snowplow and you can use this helper expect Snowplow event. And that makes it really easy to test it out. This is all you have to do to test out the event that you can see above.
And another thing to note is that when we're adding new events, we want to put them into an event dictionary so that we can see all the events that are implemented in the code base and we can see and we can see what they're about. So we have this command to generate an event definition file. You can provide the category and action and whether or not it's EE, those will be pre-filled. Once you've filled out the definition file, which we'll take a look at on the next slide, you can generate the event dictionary, which will automatically populate that based on the definition file you just added. Oops. So here's an example of an event definition for the event we were looking at. You can see the description issue promoted to Epic, the category action, the property description, which is talking about what did we put in the property? What do we put in the value? What extra properties do we have, if any? What identifiers are we sending with the event? Who's the owner of the event? And then when was it introduced and what MR introduced it? And lastly, where is the event available? So automatically you will get category action and distributions. The rest will be up to you to fill out based on the event that you're adding. And roadmap. So progress by April, 2021, we've standardized the backend and front end tracking functions. We've created a GitLab standard schema, which is sent with all events. We've created an event dictionary and a generator for event definitions. We've updated documentation and we've added, we've allowed adding extra properties to events. Some next steps we'll be looking at are further standardization of backend and front end tracking, transitioning ownership of snowplow infrastructure and rebuilding snowplow data models and transformations using DBT to make querying easier. That's it from us. Are there any questions? I think I have the first question on the agenda. Um, I started using Snowplow data to understand what the most commonly used browser resolutions are. And what I saw was that the most commonly used resolution is actually 1024 by 768. But it seems to all come from tests or from some kind of, I don't know whether it's scrapers, tests, something else. But it makes up apparently 6% of all unique page views while it only makes up 0.2% of all total page views. And so I wanted to understand, is there a way to filter these out in a smart way? Or do we have to do this whenever we create a new chart on SciSense? Or is there any plan to solve this globally? Yeah, so one of, one of the next steps, which is on the slide before this, will be looking into data modeling using DBT. So maybe as part of that step, if we could create an issue for this, we could look into maybe filtering out those events which might be generated by bots. And we could do that automatically so that whoever is creating the chart doesn't need to worry about that. That would be awesome. I'll also add to this. Um, so this is also something that we're hoping to do soon, which is uh, separate events coming from different uh, environments and applications. And I've linked over to uh, an Epic, which uh, I believe Ali, you opened up. Um, and I guess this is a question for Ali. Uh, would the fix here be to add the environment uh, where these events are being sent from and then just to do the filter on the environment? I think in this case, Marcel was describing, it seems like some kind of bot traffic. So we can maybe look at the user agent or a combination of things like resolution plus user agent, something. We would have to find a pattern to identify this traffic and then filter it out based off of that. I can link the dashboard from SciSense if that helps. Um, I think it would be pretty easy to filter them out because they look completely different to all the other ones, but that's just a wild guess from somebody who has no clue about what he's talking about. And these are front-end events. Yeah, these are front-end events. So we, we have a lot of information that comes with front-end events by default. So we can 
there's a very good chance we can identify those. Like we also have IPs, for example, if they're coming from the same place. So we jump into the next question uh, from Alper. Do you want to go okay. to I have several questions. So first one is, uh, I find the data attributes really easy to use when I need custom events. I just noticed that you did something nice with DJI Togo, which is very useful. Uh, although GitLab UI components are clickable or have certain interactions, was there any plan on the product intelligence side to also empower other clickable or interactable GitLab UI components to be easily uh, to easily be used in I mean used tracking by just setting some attributes like data attributes. That's a that's a pretty good question. And first of all, uh, we are pretty lucky that most of the uh, elements, most of UI elements, was we click. So it is uh, although it it look it seems pretty generic it does cover a, a, a huge amount of, of, of cases. And a specific case we were covering before was the use of dropdowns. So if you attach an event using data attributes to a dropdown, you will get a, you will get those events dispatched either when it's open or, or closed. Although uh, I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, we haven't thought about adding custom, uh, more custom or auto events uh, from components, but this is a great idea. So the, uh, it is good that we talk about this now so we can follow up. And Donna, you, do, do you want to vocalize that? Yeah, because we have auto, auto tracking turned on, but the way the Snowplow um, JavaScript works is that things need to be rendered on the page before we add the auto tracking. So we're only auto tracking Hamel links. I think this is how it was, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, is that still turned on? Are people still using that? Cause that's a separate, that's also a separate event structure than the other, um, than the structured events we're defining. Is that right? That's right. Yes, yes, you are okay. uh, completely correct. The although although we do have the ability of using uh, of, of tracking all the links automatically, we are trying to push forward using uh, structured events uh, explicitly. So and you will also get uh, all of these schemas with add like the GitLab standard schema that will be filled with more things uh, in the future. So uh, the answer will be that although we of course we are not going to uh, restrict using this kind of, uh, of tracking. And there is also form tracking, for example. Uh, we, we work a lot on, on getting the structure event uh, cover most of our cases. So the, the, our preference will be to be explicit about it. Uh, but yeah, does, does this answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it is possible, but, but yeah, let's, let's uh, uh, or preference is to use explicit. Uh, in, in this case, the the most easy, uh, the easiest way will be adding a data attribute to the element. I can I can speak to that stuff a little bit. It, that that was like pushed pretty early on to enable that tracking, and it was intentionally not implemented in a way that like added form tracking or link tracking on everything. Um, the growth team implemented that stuff early on and it was important like it's generally important that we track things with intention and not just everything uh, because a stream of data is only partially useful when we're trying to run experiments um, it's more relevant if, if they're focused on the experiment so um, I, I have some stuff in around form tracking and flight uh, if that's relevant but you have to uh, they should always be white, uh, in, whitelisted. I don't like using that term, but that's what Snowplow uses. You have to provide a list of classes of inputs and forms that you want to allow to have form tracking on it because that pushes a lot of information that isn't our information into assist, you know, into the data layer that I don't, 
I don't think we need to push in. So that's why it's not turned on and functional for everything after the initial page render. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much, Jeremy. So do you want to continue, Alper, with the third so, question? Next question. Uh, sometimes uh, we need to fire a custom event in addition to the global general page view event. So what happens is that you have two events, which are more or less 90% the same in snowplow terms. Will there be a way in the future maybe to have to you leverage the extra attributes so that we pass some information to the global page event rather than having a duplicate event? And then I saw your last one of your last slides that you have a plan to actually uh, make the extra attribute a bit more easier to use for other things. And could that be, I don't know, a good idea too or not, or is it in the plan? That's, a, that, that's not only a good idea, that's a great idea. <laughs> that's a great idea, yes, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm currently working on, a, on improving the way that X-ray is passed on front end. And, and yeah, this, this, this looks like a, like a low hanging fruit and we could add that API. So yeah, yeah, it, it, looks, it looks like a, like a pretty good idea. I, I'm, I'm surely going to follow you up. Yeah, like we give for each page like a title easily. So that way we can give the extra. I saw it on your last slide before the q and I think. Okay, third question is easier than, uh, in some slides you were putting an array for category or label. Uh, just a short question maybe. Uh, does it mean that we can really send there multiple items in the category or label or was it just a pseudocode for the slides? Yes. Yes, that's zero code. I, I should have mentioned it <laughs> on the slide. But yeah, um, uh, with uh, the, uh, the name inside of brackets, what, I, uh, what we tried to exemplify was variable data. So in the case of the category, uh, again, in the front end is automatically provided. Although uh, we might work on that in the future about making a, um, the, the category as useful as, as we could make it. Um, but yeah, on the front end uh, it is on uh, between bracket that, and that's the resulting string. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, no, thank you Jer for that. Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I was interested about this these tracking definition YAMLs and what that might mean for experiments, which already need a feature flag YAML, probably some metric YAMLs at some point, and then uh, tracking event YAMLs. Is it, it, I sort of jumped in a little bit late. Is that what they're for? I would need to describe and document every one of the events on an experiment that I would implement fairly quickly and remove fairly quickly. Is that the case? I think if, if they're eventually, if they're getting removed quickly, then maybe we can make an exception for that because the event dictionary is more of a long-term document describing what events are present in our code base. So if they're going to be removed, then maybe we can make an exception for that. Okay. Uh, that makes sense to me. I think uh, a quick counter argument to that would be, um, that they end up staying there and we have long running experiments and then we start to have a gap between what's being implemented in snowplow and what's available in our dictionary let's get together then and try and figure out how we can do that efficiently like specify that uh experiment events are handled in a specific way um I, as an engineer i'm not driving the cleanup of those that's product and if engineering has to suffer because of products not taking the initiative on cleaning things up. That's kind of a bummer, but you have a valid point. Uh, just trying I can to see it happening. Uh, that's why like the experiment cleanup oh, yeah. piece gets delayed, you know, it six helps. months down the road. I think there's been experiments that have been implemented and running for more than a year. And that's kind of a, yeah, uh, that's a problem. Uh, so let's think about that. I don't know the right answer to that, but we want experimentation to be quick and we're implementing things to make it 
the opposite of that. And so I, I want to raise that as a concern. Uh, and I'm just going to move on to my second question. Um, uh, so we can't use the standard context on the back end because it doesn't look like we have any way of, uh, there's arguments for project and namespace and user. Obviously we would never, we wouldn't be using that one. Um, but it looks like we can't use the standard context yet for uh, project or namespace. Is that correct? Yeah, we're waiting for the rollout of our privacy policy to tackle um, the identifiers once we figure out how to handle those. So an interesting point there is that in experimentation, we've already been asked to track project and namespace ID. Um, is that, uh, are, are any of those, are all of those events uh, a concern for us? If that's the case. I think those would be a concern. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards um, and uh, pinpoint exactly which events those are. Okay. Um, and then I, I was a little bit unsure, and it's not super clear if you pass in a record or the ID. So it would it would be nice if that if that was clear clearer. Yeah, we pass in the records. I'll take a look at the documentation and see if we can make that a bit more explicit. Is it consistent between the back end and the front end, or is it like? On the front end, you don't actually pass that information. It's pre-filled from the back end. That makes perfect sense. All right, that's all I had. Thank you. So in regards to that, I, I did start a simple draft tomorrow a while ago that just tries to detect if there's an at namespace or at group or at project or whatever present and just throw that into that context, um, basically as the page is rendering, um, if it's there. So that MR could get merged in. It's a very simple, stupid solution to that <laughs> problem. It's not very smart, but um, if those objects are present then they would show up in your standard context automatically. But it, it's in violation of our privacy policy currently, it sounds like. Um, oh, just, I see. I just see. to clarify, though, you can you can pass those in. Like, we should always pass in as much information as we can to the, the tracking API or the standard context object. And it's up to the implementation of the standard context to figure out what we're sending and what we're not sending. So that once the privacy policy is rolled out, we can basically just change one line of code and have that information sent through. That That's perfect, but it doesn't work for experimentation where there is a dashboard that is actually drawing information from that. And so if I say, oh, I'm including uh, the namespace ID here um, and it's not in the data, I would obviously be incorrect in saying that. So even though I'm tracking it, it's not tracked, right? So I have to circumvent that if the request from the project manager, product manager is to track, uh, or, or the data analyst is to track a, a namespace yeah. ID or a project. Jeremy, ID. yesterday I had a case where I explicitly asked several people um, about namespace ID, and uh, the decision in my yesterday MR was to remove it, uh, since I think it's not ready. So I, I also thought, like you, uh, that it's available. And, it turns out it's not uh, from like yesterday's experience. Okay, that's good to know. It's it it yeah. We'll talk about some of that off, offline. Looks like I've got the next point there, which I think might be answered by Jeremy's comment below. But just wondering. Um, how easy it is to add that extra object details to front end events. I didn't notice any examples of it in the slides. Um, whether we could use data track extra or when we pass it to, you know, tracking dot whatever event. Um, how is that added? And it looks like Jeremy says to add it to the GL Snowplow standard context. Um, so, yeah. No, but that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And you're right, we, we didn't add any examples of that. But um, for now, we can pass it along the rest of the properties, and it is going to be included 
in the in the standard context. So that's that's the the the, the soon to be documented way to, of doing it. Uh, and if it is going to be like uh, like uh, any any other property of the structure event like labor category, and you ask a question about using the data track extra attribute, and that's the, yeah, that's a that's a great question. The um, it brings uh, it also brings the question about should we dump a, a, a JSON event in in a property to be used as a, as an extra, and and the answer the answer might be might be yes yes of course so so yeah this is great uh, we we should we should add support for this totally and uh, Jeremy's answer is also right we could we could modify the, the snowball standard context and uh, as it it, it is. It is read every time you fire an object, uh, an event, so you can add it at any point, and it will it will be taken into consideration for that event. So that's another solution as well. Does that mean it would also potentially muddy other events using that standard context after that event fires? If I've added more context, yes. In that so, case, in that case, uh, a cleanup will be will be needed. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, on to my next point, which also relates to the extra object. I'm just wondering how simple that is to get in Sysense. I know that's kind of been uh, a point of contention, I guess, in the past of how easy it is to send that data along. So what, like whether we need to know what keys are coming through, whether we need to transform them or flatten them in some way. And then on the Sysense side, how simple it is to query those if they're in a JSON object or if they've been flattened in their kind of first class, you know, attributes, whatever. Um, just what the process is there. If that's part of this conversation or not, that's fine too. I'm just wondering if there's been something implemented. Yeah, so right now, extra is sent inside a deeply nested JSON object, which is extremely difficult to query. So part of our work for Q2 is to make some adjustments to our DBT transformations so that we can flatten that out and extra Basically, all the GitLab specific properties that we've added, like environment, source, namespace, project, and extra, those will be flattened out into separate fields. So eventually, extra will be available in one column as a JSON object. Cool. That makes sense. Uh, and then my final point is just a point of clarification on example six on slide 15. Um, it wasn't clear to me if tracked target would literally be the value, the string tags or repositories, or if those were stand-ins for some way of identifying a specific tag or a specific repository. And if it was a specific repository or tag, what that value might look like, if there's maybe some limitation on characters or length. Um, yeah. Yeah, those, those are just the two strings. It was either the string tags or the string repositories. Got it. Makes sense. Um, just out of curiosity, is there uh, a limit on the text that can be in those um, properties? That's a good question. I'm pretty sure there is, but I don't know what it is. We'll have to look into that and document it. Yeah, cool. and to and to add uh, on that, we did uh, analyze uh, all of the events that we are, were being fired. Um, and, and we didn't we didn't hit we didn't saw any truncated data so you might you uh, so yeah again uh, what Ali said but it thing is pretty uh, it is pretty ample so it's good enough for what we're using it for now huh, at least yes all right that's it for me on to Donald uh, cool so yeah my question and I think Albert answered it there um, but previously when we used the wrong like when we sent um, a bad uh, value to snowplow for any of the attributes, uh, we wouldn't get any type of um, any type of tracking on that event. So, like for category or for label, if we sent over a boolean or an integer instead of a string, um, we would lose access to the entire event. Is that still the case? Do you know? Um, or how, how does that work if we mess up on the implementation side of tracking? Um, so let me answer this because um, I have made some statistical analysis on the GitLab um, data warehouse bed events table. Then um, I discovered that 
Elado'da events um, in the GitLab codebase were sending a string instead of a float in the value type, for example, or some other issues. They were discarded and there's no way to recover them actually. Uh, so that's why uh, we came up with this, um, you know, definition efforts, event dictionary, and then uh, I have linked an issue there, which Rajendra is working on. So the idea is to have a way to validate those events early on during the development or testing cycle. And unfortunately, uh, there might still be some events which are actually discarded failing, but they are anyway present in the code base. So in Q1, uh, Q2 or so, I think we shall have a better situation where it will be harder to uh, make bad events which are discarded silently without knowing. Uh, for now, I wonder if it'd be helpful to uh, just remind or ping, uh, especially the front end maintainers, uh, that we should be checking that we're passing the correct type. Um, uh, so we have the product intelligence review now for all events. Anyway, a product intelligence team per Snowplow uh, review guidelines is going to actually check it. That's since a few months. It's um, handled as part of the review process, but hopefully it will be automated. Cool. Uh, should I move to the next question then? Uh, Jeremy, I think you had a comment under that one about the Ruby library. Yeah, the Ruby library is really strict about the, the typing. So um, I, I know this doesn't apply to your question exactly, Donald, but uh, things are caught on the Ruby layer much easier because the test in the Ruby library will fail and tell you like, you can't pass a string here. It's, it's supposed to be a decimal, right? So um, that that's useful to know. I just kind is of that only... Is that only true for running it through tests, automated testing? I mean, if, if the line that does the tracking event is ever called, it will raise an exception, yes. So, I mean, if that okay. line is not covered, then yeah. <laughs> I so it could be at runtime of the app, we just see exceptions in our exception logger related to that if we Correct. haven't tested it, okay. Correct, and, and it, it halts execution. It doesn't happen in a background process or the async emitter doesn't uh, cause that to happen. I, I, I think it happens within that same process of, of the application instance. So it's kind of a bad thing. Yeah, we've made some changes to that recently where we rescue that exception so that if there is a bad event, it doesn't actually cause a 500 error. And we do still log that in one of the logs. Does that happen Check that in quickly. tests as well? Because it should probably not happen in tests to capture that. It's been a very useful exception for everyone. That it looks like we re-raise that for development and test. Okay. And we only rescue that in production. Okay. I will add so I will also like to add uh, to that answer that in our uh, in the review guidelines that Alper mentioned, we have a new section that uh, optionally requires a screenshot of uh, the 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 Snowplow testing tool used to see that the event was dispatched correctly. So that will be another layer of verification that 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 we are using the, the, the right taxonomy and that we are not uh, committing errors because as you know, JavaScript uh, and our JavaScript is not typed. So um, gladly, most of the uh, fields are uh, strings. So those are more lenient. Uh, <laughs> when when that errors happens, but in case of value, for example, uh, although although we won't see any any uh, exception, we are I mean in the in the resulting in the resulting screenshot of the event, we are going to see that the that it might not it it might be 
it, 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 if I mean, if we pass uh, something that is not a value, we might not see it on the on the screenshot. Yeah, so there was some cases where the value was an object and it was serialized into a string. And um, I think it's also not an acceptable use case of the like um, a string attribute to get a serialized object inside. Just adding on top of what you said. Yeah, now we have the the really useful extra properties. So we can that's that's also the like one of our preferred tools. Yeah, maybe we should preferred remove tool. this automatic serialization somehow, which uh, like if for example in my MR I give an object there or an array by mistake to a string, it's not going to fail on the front end if I'm not wrong, then it, but it's going to just get serialized as a valid um, event. I'm not sure if it's the right thing. If it's not the right thing, then maybe we should also catch it uh, somehow. No, but this is something that I'm going to follow up with, definitely. I think I have the last uh, point under uh, Donald, your question. Um, so we've started uh, upstream right now and just trying to standardize how we actually collect the events. Uh, but there's this whole transformation piece uh, that we don't have much visibility into right now. Uh, we do know that the bad events are caught and stored, um, but uh, we haven't done much with those bad events yet. So our approach really has been to standardize upstream. Uh, and then what we can do later on is possibly go back and see if we can sort of uh, rescue or revive those bad events. Uh, but it's pretty unlikely since they were probably captured in a um, format that isn't matching what we're uh, what the current format is. So those might have to be discarded. Cool. Okay, got a minute. I'll ask this question quickly, hopefully. Um, so just to clarify, uh, snowplow events, even from the back end, um, are not, they're going to the same collector right so we do not get snowplow events for self-managed instances like we're not tying that into usage ping in any way or anything like that is that correct that is correct um we do have a plan in the future to uh, add a snowplow collector and a snowplow data store uh, into a self-managed instance where you could collect that data and then that data could be summarized and aggregated uh, via usage ping, but that hasn't been rolled out yet. That will hopefully be uh, Q3, Q4, where we get to start working on that. Albert, did you want to vocalize your comment there? I think let me vocalize Jeremy's comment first. Um, so you oh, have to sorry, <laughs> sorry, Jeremy. Or if Jeremy, you wanna verbalize, just I just edit on top of Jeremy's comment. If you wanna verbalize yours, please. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's just configured in the admin interface, and it doesn't make sense. Dot uh, com is is just configured to use our collector. We we wouldn't want self managed to be reporting into our collector because it really does leak potential information from their self managed instance that they would never want to turn on. Um, so. I envision eventually being able to have some rollups through through defining metrics and having a collector on the back end. And this has been a, a concept for a long time. I, again, though, it's like one of those things that they would want to, I, I think we should be respectful to our users about, and they should have to opt into this concept and, and be sure that they're comfortable with, with that. And that's, I think, part of what the documenting, the value of documenting all of the events would be. So um, I just kind of outline, it doesn't, uh, it, it, it would never make sense for any self-managed instance to configure this, to push data to us. Yeah. Yeah. So my Got comment it. on no. that, but, um, so theoretically we could roll out, um, we have removed all the references to the gitlab.com production snowplow collector. Um, but theoretically we could collect there and use the app ID as the 
self-managed instance ID for instances which desire it actually um, and have some kind of uh, snowplow collection for self-managed too in addition to the Jerome's uh, mention of the roadmap plan to have a local self-managed collector. So those are all available. I think the road taken is to have a local self-managed snowplow collector, which then aggregates the values. So at the moment, it doesn't make sense to send your like GDK or self-managed events to GitHub.com production snowplow collector because uh, no one will get any value out of it because it's going to be discarded in the DBT processing layer. Jeremy, your last question is yours. Sorry. Um, okay, experiments are run entirely on the back end and they surface through window.gon.experiment in the front end. Uh, so that we can use that information in the front end as well. That gives us which variant was rendered and uh, the context key so that we can anonymously track events associated with that experiment. Um, there's, there's some complexity around front end events and adding instrumentation and making sure that it's associated with a given experiment. And what I've come to believe would be useful for us there. And I'm sort of just pushing this knowledge back into the, uh, uh, the product intelligence team is to say in the rendering of a page, I would like all experiment contexts to be included on all events tracked on that page. So I kind of don't care what the user interacts with. There may be a reason to understand when we render this uh, experiment and this experiment, users don't interact with the new uh, project drop down or, or something like that, right? Um, and so this is something that I would like to get to in a place uh, where we don't, we don't have to do anything for that instrumentation. We just kind of say, hey, we've implemented our experiment and in this controller and this view, uh, we run our experiments and then the, the front end is not really a concern that we have to have to be involved with. This would simplify documenting and, and uh, adding events as well, because we may just want to add instrumentation and it would automatically get linked to the experiment. And then we may leave that instrumentation in place after we remove the experiment. So it's just kind of a thing where uh, I'd like to clean up the the front end logic as much as possible because it's starting to get a little convoluted and it seems like it shouldn't really be our concern. Yeah, so, I can start answering. Yeah, yeah no, I, I can start answering that and then we, we read uh, Dallas comment. Um, this is something that we, uh, I mean, we have, uh, while we have been thinking on, on improving uh, our front end classes, uh, we have been taking a look at uh, the experiment, uh, the experiment thing, of course, and we also saw this uh, a really good use case from the design team, where they extended the tracking class and they added uh, a custom logic for passing a custom uh, schema, and they were using uh, that uh, class on their view files directly. So uh, talking about uh, um, Talking about the files and, and the way that, that we keep code there, uh, uh, that, that could be a great example that we could uh, document, like how to extend uh, the tracking class and add, add a, a specific uh, logic for your use case. And you also asked about um, how to clean that up. And I believe that uh, if, we, if, we manage, if we manage to document it properly, we could say that if you, uh, that you could make sure to just stop using that that extended class and use the 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 regular class and that will remove all of the all of the related logic. So so yeah, that might be uh, that might uh, that, that's answer that a part of your question, right? 
Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. I, I might just spike on an MR if there's no like strong reason not to. Yes, of course, yes. So uh, Dallas, do you want to vocalize that? Um, sure. It's not, it's not really very important. I guess this discussion is just kind of a thought idea I had about, um, you know, this idea of the window.gl.snowplow standard context is very specific. Um, so if we pass that like a namespace idea or something, it's specific to just that context, only that context can use it. So wondering if there, uh, maybe we foresee a way to tokenize some of those values so that we can just have a generic place full of values that any context can use just by identifying that token it wants to pull the value from. Um, somewhat related, but a little bit different. So kind of hijacking Jeremy's <laughs> comment. This is a pretty interesting question. Uh, and, and to be honest, I haven't thought about it. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll be sure to, to follow it up after, after, the, after the workshop is finished because it does, it does look like something we could provide. Yeah, uh, actually to, uh, not to break the speed of the experiment development and standard event, they evolved separately. I think it's now time to really like Jeremy's uh, concern, maybe open an issue and then uh, now create a synergy out of the different efforts um, so that the experiment uh, teams, growth teams can then really get the benefits easily of front-end tracking, which includes all the experiments and some standard context easily. I think that. Uh, sorry, uh, go ahead. Yeah, should we vocalize the rest of the comments or are these just. Oh, no, no. Um, mine is at, at left, I think. Well, that was a very rich workshop. I think it's the end. <laughs> so, a very nice discussions. Congratulations to both. Alien. Yeah, yeah. Totally, I'm 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 pretty I'm I'm really happy about uh, all of the all of the questions, and I I, I add uh, one of my own. Uh, one one question that I wanted to answer in this workshop was, who should declare the taxonomy for the event? Like, if we if we have some those use cases, who should be the the person responsible to uh, declare what the label is going to be, what the action, what the well the the categories is is fairly easy, uh, or the extra properties and that's that's what I try to exemplify with the use cases. That, as you can see, they they were they didn't include any specific uh, information about the taxonomy that, that was going to be used. So uh, the short answer is that everyone can contribute. <laughs> so everyone can can uh, read the documentation. We added uh, several examples and we added like uh, um, explanation for each of the taxonomy items. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's the that's a short question that everyone can do it. And the specific one is that uh, we uh, it, it could be uh, I mean, if a manager creates a use case, uh, the documentation uh, tries to make it easy for an engineer to define what to put there. And yeah, that's that's for me. That's that was my question. I think the the role of the product intelligence team really is to um, to sort of set up the uh, tooling and the framework um, and allow all of the other teams to be able to uh, to be able to work within it. Um, I'd like the product intelligence team to stick to the tooling part of it and not to the implementation and to have all of the other teams because we have about forty different uh, groups at GitLab. Um, stages and groups at GitLab that, um, uh, that have tracking needs and uh, we should really aim to enable all of them um, instead of doing the Apple actual implementation. So uh, that would just be uh, my two cents on that. I agree, yes. So that brings us to the end of the workshop. Thank you so much. This was 
super great and especially, especially the follow-up um, the, the follow question to answer. So, so uh, thank you so much for attending. This was great again, thank you. I also wanted to just to give a really big thank you to uh, Axel and Ali on putting together this workshop. Um, it's only been uh, one quarter where we've had dedicated efforts working on snowplow tooling. And I think it's uh, come a very long way. So thank you all.